I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do not care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. All right, hello and welcome again to The Narrow Mind. My name is Gene Cook. I am the host of The Narrow Mind. The Narrow Mind is a weekly radio broadcast that takes place every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 6 p.m. San Diego Time, which is uh, where this broadcast originates in. And by the way, it has been raining cats and dogs in San Diego. And uh, we've never had this much rain in all my lifetime. And I've, I've lived here for four decades, if I can give away my age. And uh, we also come on at 7 p.m. Mountain Time and uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we'd like to welcome you uh, to The Narrow Mind. Tonight we're going to be talking about another controversial subject, the subject of atheism. And we will be taking our calls live tonight. We would like to uh, especially talk to an atheist. If you're an atheist, we'll actually move you to the front of the line because we're, we're interested in, uh, in reaching you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're interested in seeing you become saved and coming to know the, uh, the salvation that we've come to know and the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. And so uh, tonight we're going to be talking about dialoguing, discussing your faith with atheists. If you're a Christian uh, and you've been a Christian for more than 24 hours, I'm sure that you have discussed your faith with an atheist. Uh, maybe um, he's kind of a, just an atheist that hasn't given atheism a whole lot of thought, or he might be someone who's kind of honed up on his atheistic skills, and uh, those are the kind of atheists that we're interested in talking to tonight because we think that there are some serious misconceptions about reality, the world in which we live in, the nature of faith, and how we should talk to atheists. And so we're going to be discussing that tonight. I have with me in studio my guest and friend, Paul Manata. Paul, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Thanks, Gene. All right, good to have you with me again. Uh, now, Paul lives here locally. He goes to a different church. He actually goes to... What's the name of your church? Uh, it's North City Presbyterian Church. Okay, and that is a PCA church, right? Yes, PCA. Which is Presbyterian Churches of America. Right. All right, I also know his pastor. He's a fine uh, preacher and, uh, and pastor. So, uh, we're going to be discussing apologetics and atheism. atheism. Once again, if you're an atheist, uh, please give us a call tonight at one 800 466 1873, that's toll free, 1-800-466-1873, taking your calls live. Now, Paul and I have been uh, talking about the subject of atheism because uh, Paul is active in uh, participating in internet chat sites or internet uh, bulletin boards. So why don't you kind of tell, tell our listening audience uh, how the discussion that kind of developed between you and I that prompted us to have this program tonight. Uh, well, basically, it started uh, because there were some some atheists or some people that are non Christians, so they they say that they're not atheists. But they were over at your site, at Which Unchained is, Radio. Okay. Uh, they were over there and uh, having some discussions with with some of us, uh, some some Christians over there. And basically, they're from a site called xchristian dot net. So I went over to that site to see uh, what was going on there and to hear. Uh, how they were talking uh, over on that site, and, and to see sort of what they were, um, how they were analyzing the discussions that we were having um, over on your site. And when I went over there, there were some uh, claims that they had pointed out certain fallacies, uh, and I went over there and asked them to point out exactly where they did this. And when I went over there, um, instead of getting in that discussion, basically, I was told, before I had, any, I had even asserted anything, before I had said, I'm here to prove God's existence or anything like that, I just went over there and said, could you point out these fallacies that you had pointed out for us, since I knew that they hadn't, um, I was told immediately that I have, I have the burden of proof, I'm asserting God's existence, and so um, I need to get busy proving God's existence, and they can just sit back and kind of sip their tea and not really have anything to do, just say that, oh, that argument doesn't cut it for me, because they have what they call a lack of belief in God. So atheism is kind of being redefined. Did you notice that? That uh, atheism once meant that uh, it was the belief that there is no God, but the atheists that we've been talking to of late are kind of redefining atheism. What kind of definition are they giving you? 
Uh, well, the definition that they give is they say it's a lack of belief. And this isn't really that new uh, because in Greg Bonson's debate with Gordon Stein, Gordon Stein defined atheism this way um, as a lack of belief. And this is basically to avoid the burden of proof. It's also discussed, and Gordon uh, Bonson asked Dr. Stein uh, for sources, and Dr. Stein uh, mentioned George Smith's book, Atheism, the Case Against God, and also uh, had said that he could uh, quote Charles Bradlaugh as well. Um, furthermore, Michael Martin, in his book, Atheism, a Philosophical Justification, he um, discusses this topic and uh, about atheism being a lack of belief uh, in the existence of God. And the arguments for that, I, I don't think, are, are too convincing, but it has been a, uh, a redefinition, I do believe, because pretty much if, if you go to any um, philosophy, uh, a companion to philosophy, you'll see that atheism is assigned, is assigned as disbelief or the, the belief that there are no gods. So basically, the, the um, definition as a non-belief, what that does is just avoids the burden of proof. Mm -hmm. When you say you lack a belief, you're not asserting any positive belief. So since you lack a belief, you don't have an, uh, a positive assertion, and therefore you can just sort of sit back and you don't have to do any defending yourself. So you come over and you say, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the, the, the triune God of the Bible. And they say, well, um, you need to prove that this God exists. In other words, the burden of proof lies on your shoulders because you are making... Uh, a claim that something exists and we don't see it we don't see this something namely God Jesus Christ we don't see him we can't experience him with our senses and so because you're making a claim such as um, you know there are unicorns living on the planet of Mars the burden of proof is on you to actually um, pr provide evidence that this is the that this is the the fact that this is the way things are um, and so they're saying that because they don't believe in God, because they haven't seen him, and he's nowhere to be found as well, far as they're concerned. They're saying they have a lack of belief. So they're it's not, not so much as saying, I don't believe. They're just saying, I lack the belief totally. Okay, so I, the, the belief is absent in my life. Um, and so because the belief is absent in my life, and you're making a positive claim, you need to prove to me why I should believe in this Christian God that you're telling me about. So from the beginning, they have a presupposition, right? Correct. And their presupposition is that God doesn't exist. Well, uh, no, since they, they wouldn't necessarily say that because they're saying they have a lack of belief about God's existence. What their presupposition, though, and this is, is where they're not too self-conscious, um, their presupposition is, well, first off, I guess we should backtrack a bit and say that burden of proof, my argument is that burden of proof uh, d is determined by one's worldview. Uh, and our worldview, according, according to our worldview, if you took Christian presuppositions and the, Christ, the whole Christian story, um, basically that's, it states that all men know that God exists, that it's more evident and more sure than the nose on your face. Uh, G.E. Moore, in uh, a book uh, many, many decades ago, said, who can deny that a hand is in front of my face? Well, what we're saying is that God's existence is more plain than that. And so the one who denies that is really making the absurd claim, the, the one uh, using the analogy with uh, Moore, he's denying the hand in front of his face. Furthermore, the Bible tells us that all men do know that God exists. Where does it tell us that? In Romans 1, it says all men know that God exists, and then it furthermore tells us about self-deception. So we can make sense of atheism, or professed atheism, in that they, they believe that they, they do not. They do believe that God exists. They know that God exists, but they also hold a belief falsely that God does not exist. Mm. So they believe two things simultaneously. One's a second order, uh, a second order belief. And that's where self-deception plays. Uh, is that second, uh, second order level? And so what they're doing is they're saying that by saying I have a lack of belief, and that you need to prove God's existence because I don't see Him, or there, there's no no obvious proof out there, or what have you. What they're basically saying by that is that Christianity is wrong. They're saying that that Romans one is wrong because Rome, since Romans one says that they do they do know that God exists, since they say they lack a belief, they're saying that Paul is wrong there. And if Paul is wrong, Scripture is wrong, God's wrong, the Bible's wrong. So by claiming that you're an atheist, even if it's a lack of belief, you still have made a positive assertion. Okay, so they are from the beginning. 
uh, just by saying that I don't believe that God exists, uh, they are saying that it, in their understanding of the world, the Bible couldn't possibly be true, at least not, not, not to this point. Well, that's why I said they're not too self-conscious about it. They don't think they're saying that. They okay. think they're okay. saying they have a lack of belief. So they're not saying, I don't believe God exists. And by saying, I have this lack of belief, and so you have to prove it. I haven't asserted anything. What I'm saying is, by you saying you have a lack of belief, you have asserted something. You're mm-hmm. asserting that people can have lacks of belief about God's existence when the Bible says that they can't. Okay. Now, the Bible, uh, I mean, obviously at this point the atheist is going to say, well, it's just a book. You're, you're making a claim that a book tells, tells you that I believe that God exists, even though, or that I know that God exists, even though I don't believe that. So, I mean, how do you answer that uh, that criticism when they when they say, well, you're, it's just a book like any other book? Well, basically, what we need to do is backtrack even a little bit further and point out that people, everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a worldview, which is basically a a, ba- a basic set of presuppositions, and those can be defined as um, as a basic view of life. Um, by which basic belief that you hold either subconsciously or consciously by which you interpret all of your evidence all the evidence in your experience so you bring presuppositions to experience and everyone has these presuppositions and a worldview is a network of these presuppositions so since everyone has a worldview everyone um, classifies evidence looks at evidence and says which evidence will be counted and which evidence should be discounted by their worldview. So what I'm saying is, first off, that from our worldview, from the Christian worldview, um, according to our worldview, if it were true, there would be no such thing as an atheist. An atheist wouldn't exist. Uh, that is, someone who truly lacks a belief, or truly um, does not believe in God. Now, we do believe that there are professed atheists due to self-deception. So, first off, I'm claiming that from our worldview, um, we're saying that atheists don't exist. So if our worldview was true, the atheist um, would be wrong by saying from, for saying that he's an atheist. Maybe we maybe we need to talk about just briefly what the Bible means when it says that all men know God, because obviously there's a sense in which a non-Christian doesn't know God. Right. 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 So uh, so what Rome, what exactly is Paul saying there when he says that in Romans chapter one that all men know God? Romans 1 basically tells us that um, what, what Paul is saying, that all men have a knowledge of God, is that they, they know that this God exists, but this knowledge is, is a knowledge eno- just enough to give them uh, wrath. It's not enough. It's not a saving knowledge. It's just a knowledge that God exists. He has made the world. He has made them. He's given them laws and written them upon their heart. Uh, but this knowledge isn't a knowledge that a Christian would have, such as Jesus died for my sins and... Uh, I need to throw myself on on his life and death in order to be uh, right before the Father. So that knowledge is something that's given to us by special revelation. The knowledge that the atheists have, and that all men do have, is a knowledge given to us by general revelation, uh, which is found in the created order. Everything in in the world um, reveals that God exists. So it's it's only a knowledge that God exists. It's not a knowledge of salvation. And the knowledge that they have is only sufficient uh, to send them to hell. So, for example, if I said, I know George Bush, somebody said, uh, you're an American, you know, I'm, I'm traveling to a foreign com- country, so George Bush is your president? Yes, I know George Bush. Um, I can say that I know George Bush because I'm, I'm aware of his office, I'm aware of his presidency, I'm aware of his policies, I see him on TV, but I don't know him, for example, in the same way that his brother knows him or that his father knows him, or that his wife knows him. And so I think maybe that's the way in which Paul is talking about men knowing God exists. They have just a, a, a basic knowledge that there is a God. They don't know who he is. They, don't, they, they know that he's all-powerful because they see his works in creation, and they, they witness um, you know, his, his management of this world, and they, they witness the fact that you know, he brings the earth and cycles that are, are stable and continuous and uniform. Uh, but, and I suppose that's the reason why man is inherently religious. But at the same time, they don't know him in the way that a Christian does. A Christian knows God and has a personal, we say, a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. In other words, he knows him intimately. 
He has a saving knowledge of him. Um, for example, I could say that I know how to change a tire um, just because I've opened a textbook and somebody has told me, well, you take the lug nuts off and then you put the spare on and, and so on. But uh, I could also say I know how to change a tire experientially because I've changed tires before. There's a difference there. And so the type of Christian that a knowledge, or the type of knowledge that a Christian has, is that experiential knowledge because he's come to know God uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. So when the Bible says that all men know God, uh, the Bible is telling us the Creator of, of of man is telling us something about man that even sometimes he's unwilling to admit himself. In other words, from the Christian perspective, when we talk to an unbeliever, we know things about him that he doesn't know himself or at, at best he's unwilling to admit. right? Because he, the Bible right. tells us that he knows God because he's made in the image of God even though that image has been shattered, it's been marred by the fall. Uh, but he's a moral being, he's a logical being uh, and there are differences between him and the animal kingdom and he knows there's differences. He, he, in fact, he lives with those differences. And when those differences are blurred, uh, he becomes upset whether he believes in God or not. So he actually reflects the nature of God in the way he lives, the way he thinks, the way he interacts in this creation, but yet at the same time, he denies that there's a God that made him in whose image he's made, uh, but the Bible tells us behind all of that, he actually knows God exists. So in his heart of hearts, we're saying what the Apostle Paul said, he knows God exists. So, when the atheist says to us, the burden of proof is on you because you're making a claim. How is our claim different than the claim that there's pink unicorns living on Mars? In other words, somebody can make a claim, a preposterous claim, that something exists. Uh, we can't see it. We can't touch it. We don't know it. So what's the difference there? Uh, well, I guess first we'd have to address a lot of the, the presuppositions about uh, that someone would hold that if you can't see or touch something, it wouldn't exist. But basically to deal with the, the, the general comment you made is that I'm not saying that we don't have a job to do. We do offer arguments for God's existence, and we can uh, show, that God, show that God exists. But what I'm claiming uh, here is that just from right off the bat, when the atheist tells us we have, we have a burden of proof because they lack a belief, from our worldview... That's not true. From our worldview, they have the burden of proof. They're the ones basically saying that the pink unicorn exists that you can't see, hear, and touch. By saying that God doesn't exist, they're denying something that they know. Um, it's more clear. It's so clear, in fact, that they are without excuse. It's so, they know this so much um, that they, are not, they do not even have an excuse for denying God. So from our worldview, from within our worldview... They, we do not have the burden of proof, they do. So by saying that we have the burden of proof, all you've done is assumed that Christianity is false right from the start. So, that so if, we, if we agree, yes, we have the, the burden of proof, then we in fact are assuming that the Bible isn't true when it says that all men know God. That's what you're getting at, right? Right. Well, I'm saying that we do have a job to do, but I'm saying that I do have a burden. I'm going to show something here in the, in the rational arena when we, when we have to sit, uh, debate and, and give... Um, positive uh, arguments for our for our beliefs we do have a job to do but yes ultimately if i were to say yes well i i do have a burden of proof god is sort of sitting on the defendant's chair and let's kind of look at the evidence and see if he exists what we're really doing there is denying as christians now and i'm speaking to christians what we're doing if we do that is we are acting immorally because jesus says he who is not with me is against me so if we are not for him if we don't say um that were for him, and he and he said that all men know that he exists, and we are we have to think his thoughts after him, etc. If we if we say no, let's put him to the side, then we act as if there's something neutral. When Jesus said there was only two positions for and against him, so by saying that there's a neutral field, uh, you're saying that Jesus is wrong. So as Christians, yes, we shouldn't sit there and let the atheist uh, act as if God is on the on the defendant's chair and he needs to provide evidence for for people to believe because it's somehow lacking. Uh, because Romans one tell, tells us that the evidence is not lacking and all men do know that God exists and this and this knowledge and the evidence God has provided is unavoidable. So why do you think it's such a common problem then with atheists uh, f for them to say, if they know in their heart of hearts that God exists, why do they 
you know, why do they demand these uh, these proofs that God exists? If if the Bible is true and what it says that they know in their hearts that God exists. Well, there's a lot of uh, reasons that we could give for that, but one one reason is because uh, the natural man, speaking again from a Christian worldview here, uh, the answers that we get from within our worldview is that the natural man hates God. He has a uh, mind that is depraved, and he seeks to suppress all this evidence God has given him. He suppresses it and says, no, there is no God. God doesn't exist. So it's somewhat like the, the, the analogy some people have heard before about the man with the beach ball who puts the beach ball underneath water, sits on it, and puts his hands up in the air and says, Where, where's the beach ball? Where's the beach ball? And eventually the beach ball is going to pop up. So they suppress it, but they can't totally suppress it. It'll, it'll pop up every once in a while. But that's why that they think that we have the burden of proof is because, one, uh, they do not... They, they, they suppress the truth that God has given us, according to Romans 1. They hate God. They also believe that neutrality is possible, uh, which is a, a myth that is prevalent through the universities and uh, indeed amongst many Christians as well, that people can be neutral. So they hold this belief in neutrality. A lot of them aren't very self-conscious about their own worldview. So th- I think there's, a, um, there's numerous examples we could give. So you're saying that there is no neutral position between belief and unbelief. Correct. You're either a believer in Jesus Christ or you're an unbeliever in Jesus Christ. This idea of of moving closer and closer to belief is a a, a biblically foreign concept. Would you say that? Correct, yes. Basically, we have those who are... I just will categorize it the way Jesus does. He who is not for me is against me. So I say there's two categories. Those that are for Christ, those that are against him. So actually, it's sort of uh, ironic. Those atheists who who think that they're all by themselves and they're rational and us Christians and the Hindus and the uh, Muslims and we're all on the same side. We're we're the irrational people who believe in some form of a deity or something like that. uh, And they're the rational ones. Actually, uh, the atheist is really in the same family and they're brothers under the skin with the Muslim and the Hindu. The Christians were the ones all by ourselves and the atheist is on the same side as the Hindus, the people who believe in, in rock gods and, the anim- and animists and all sorts of weirdos. I can imagine an atheist foaming at the mouth right now, you lumping him in with Hindus and animists and Muslims. Right. Uh, but once again, we do believe that Jesus is the truth and when he speaks, he speaks truth. And he says that you're either for me or you're against me. There is no neutral ground. There is no middle ground. There is no, there is no neutral place where man stands back and evaluates the truth. So I guess the question then is, if there's no neutral ground between belief and unbelief, how does man cross over from, belief, from unbelief to belief? Well, the only way that can happen is if the Spirit regenerates someone, if the, if the Holy Spirit comes and changes someone's heart and has and causes them to be reborn again. See, they're dead men. Um, the Hindus, the Muslims, and the atheists, they're all dead men. And the only way they can cross from unbelief to belief is if God changes their hearts. And in this, uh, to define my terms, um, by belief in this sense, I'm saying um, the sense Gene and I were referring to as having a saving knowledge of, of God. The only way you can have a saving knowledge of God is is by the regenerating, regenerating work of the Spirit. Now, if... You meant, Gene, how can they, uh, if they unbelieve, how can they, how can you have any dialogue with the atheists because they're always going to be unbelievers? How can you get them to accept Christian premises or anything like that? What I would say is at this point what we do is argue for the sake of argument. So we say here, accept our worldview as true just for the sake of argument, and we'll accept your worldview as true just for the sake of argument, and we'll see um, which, which worldview can provide the preconditions for knowledge, which worldview makes knowledge uh, possible. Okay, so so you say to the atheist, okay, um, let's assume that what you're telling me is true, that there is no God. And then wh- what you do is you say, I'm going to assume your worldview is true just for the sake of argument. In other words, right. okay, I'm going to go with you for a, m- a moment down your road uh, along the lines of your thinking uh, just to see if this is something that is feasible, something that's reasonable, something that, that makes sense. And so you begin to assume the worldview of the atheist. And what does that look like in, in, when it happens in a conversation, when it takes place in a conversation? Well, there's, vari- there's various, um, a variety of takes on the atheist worldview. So some atheists, for example, of a Michael Martin or, 
uh, Bertrand Russell sort will say that they are uh, pluralists and they don't hold to a strict materialism. So they'll say that they do believe that there are some uh, non-materials and non-material entities. Uh, some atheists would be strict materialists, and then there's even uh, fights within the materialist camp. So there's not a particular. Um, this is the way it's always going to happen with an atheist, but usually. What happens is is what you're going to end up showing. What you're going to try to show is that by denying Christ and denying the Christian worldview, you can't make sense out of anything. So you're going to um, want to ask about proof and the preconditions of proof, and you're going to ask the atheist how does he how does he account for 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 example uh, the uniformity of nature, since he might think that well I don't believe because science has disproven uh, God's existence. You're going to go and say well what what are the preconditions? What would have to be the case for science to even operate, for science to be possible? And one of those things is the uniformity of nature, that nature is uniform and that we can also reason inductively. So then we're going to look at uniformity of nature and inductive reasoning and see if the atheist can give an account for this. When you talk about uniformity of nature, you mean four seasons, you know, fall follows summer and winter follows fall. Is that what you're referring That's to? In, in, in one sense, you can say, but it's ba- a general, basically, um, uh, generally, it is that you, that nature behaves in a uniform way. So when we say, well, how do you know that because you have uh, seen X number of cases in the past, uh, how do you know that that you'll be able to to know that in the future? So, for example, I've seen the toothpaste come out of the toothpaste tube 30 times, you know, in my past. Every time that it's full and unobstructed, when I squeeze it, toothpaste comes out. So, therefore, it will come out the next time I squeeze it. When we ask, well, how do you, what gives you the right to reason from, from the past to the future, from the particular, from particular um, instances to make a general rule out of it? And the, the, the basic answer is, well, nature behaves in a law-like way. So, that's, nature is uniform. Then you would say, well, how do you know nature behaves in a law-like way? And then you say, well, because it has in the past such and such, and now they've went back to an inductive argument. So they've given an inductive argument for the toothpaste. Then they went to the uniformity of nature to back up their inductive argument. Then when you ask them to back up the uniformity of nature, they go back to an inductive, inductive argument to back that up, which is a vicious circle. It kind of sounds like circular reasoning. Well, it kind of sounds. Again, we, we were using Jesus earlier about... Uh-huh. Um, about uh, no, he who is not for me is against me. We can use Jesus, um, Jesus again since he inspired all of Scripture. It's kind of like what um, the Proverbs tell us, a dog returns to its own vomit. Mm. Okay, so when you ask them to give the basis for the uniformity of nature, they, just, they, they basically fall flat. They say, well, this is just the way it's always been. Right. Well, uh, eventually, if you pu- I think m- m- most atheists, when you push hard enough, will say, well, this is just the way it is. And I don't even, in fact, need to reason about this because this is everyone knows that nature behaves this way and why are, we, why are you even asking me this? So basically, the tactic there is just to say, well, we don't need to talk about these things. These aren't important anymore. So it's sort of like uh, Procrustes where we had the, in the um, Greek stories where the man would take people into his inn and he had only one bed for them. And if they were too long then he just chopped off their legs. And if they were too short, he would just stretch them. So basically, if something doesn't fit for the atheist, well, we don't need to talk about that. That's not important anymore. Let's, let's become pragmatic. That What good does talking about induction uh, do us anyways? I, wanna, I want some uh, details about you know, how, my, how doing this is going to help me advance in my life. So. Okay, so how is your worldview superior uh, to the atheist worldview when you're talking about something like uniformity of nature? How can you as a Christian prove any basis for uniformity of nature? Okay, well, again, we all have, all men have worldviews. So what I've been saying is everyone has a worldview, and this worldview is um, what is what determines uh, reality, what, you, what is used to understand it, uh, reality and interpret evidence and such. Now, the athe- uh, our worldview, what we're saying is our worldview provides the preconditions. It's the only, it, you must assume our worldview in order to make sense of, for example, induction or the uniformity of nature. So if you're going to assume the atheist worldview, you won't be able to. Now, let's say, for argument's sake, that we've shown that, that the atheist can't. He's going to say, well, well, how do you account for this then? I'm going to say, well, basically, for one example, is Genesis 8. Genesis 8, God makes a covenant with Noah and tells him that rain time, harvest, summer, and winter, heat and cold, um, those, he will, those will remain the same. Uh, Hebrews tells us that Jesus is upholding the word by the very uh, upholding the world by the word of his power. So Jesus is upholding all things by his word. And so we have 
the, the Word of God telling us that He promises to keep nature uniform. And when we say, well, how do you know that that will happen and uh, how do you know nature will be uniform tomorrow? Well, we're taking that on the say-so of the one who knows tomorrow. So the one who knows tomorrow has told us he's going to keep nature uniform and operating in, in a law-like way. So what we're saying is, see, our worldview, Mr. Atheist, if you take our worldview, you can give a philosophical, philosophical account for induction. Take, give, given your worldview, you can't. All right. Uh, we'll be right back. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to The Narrow Mind. All right, continuing along the line of our discussion, we're talking about the burden of proof. My name is Gene Cook. I'm the host. I have with me in studio Paul Minata, a friend of mine who goes to a church that's a few miles up the road. We're talking about atheism and the burden of proof. If you missed the first segment of the show, then you'll know that um, we were talking, uh, or you wouldn't know that we were talking about the the misconception or the mis. Uh, supposition of the atheist when he says that it is the Christian or the theist who has the burden of proof since he's making a positive claim. Uh, but we pretty much discussed that and we showed that no, um, man knows that God exists according to what Jesus says by his Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. And so we are making a, a claim that's obvious because all men know that God exists. And it is therefore the atheist who has the burden of proof. So we got into talking about the uniformity of nature, how the atheist can't really give an account for the reality that nature is uniform, that it operates according to laws, that the same types of things that happened yesterday happen tomorrow. In fact, the whole scientific method is based on, um, you know, the the uh, rehearsal of certain experiments under certain conditions knowing that if the conditions are the same, the results will be the same if the theory is true. Uh, but if there is no uniformity of nature, if we, we can't know what's going to happen today or tomorrow because there is no consistency in the world in which we live in, then we've got a problem. We can't really rely on science, but yet, at the same time, many atheists are using science to argue against the God who makes science possible. And even if there was a consistency... Uh, they would have no way to know it. And so we're asking them actually an epi- to give an epistemological justification for it, which is try to um, give us, tell us how that this is justified philosophically, not not just saying, well, the world is, is uh, law-like. We would say, well, even if it was, you couldn't know that it was because man is not uh, infinite. He doesn't know the future, so he doesn't know that the future will resemble the past, especially if he's going to take an empiricist epistemology, which is, I can only know things by my senses, well then if they were to say, well I know that the toothpaste has come out, come out of the toothpaste tube before because I've observed it, and therefore I know it will do that in the future, you'd have to add the premise, well, and I've observed the future, which they haven't, so there's all sorts of problems. And basically what I'd like to do here is there's a lot of Christians that might get hammered from it, from an atheist, and when he maybe talks to an atheist friend in college or via email, or what have you, he's going to hear that he has the burden of proof, and he needs to start proving this, and the atheist thinks he can just kick his feet up and sit back and, and avoid all the tough questions. And the, and the Christian is going to be on the defensive. And what I want to tell the Christians listening is that you don't have to be, and you need to at least keep it in the atheist's face that they are assuming atheism. They're assuming that um, not all men know that God exists. They're assuming that you can be neutral. They're assuming that God's evidence isn't more plain than the nose on their face. They're assuming all these things just by just by saying, I'm an atheist, by saying I have a disbelief. They have already um, committed themselves to, to all sorts of beliefs, even though they unwittingly uh, do so. They don't think that they've done this, but but they have nevertheless. So the Christian who's listening you need to point out to the atheist that that according to your worldview, you don't have the burden of proof. The atheist does. So the atheist has just assumed your worldview is wrong. And so now what you're going to do is you're going to ask the atheist, say, so how do you know that? How do you know my worldview is wrong? And then it's going to put him um, in the defensive, and he's going to have to start answering some questions. Uh, furthermore, if he says, well, no, no, I'm an, I'm an atheist. An atheist the, uh, means that I have a disbelief in theism. You're going to say, well... I'm an a-atheist then. I have a disbelief in the existence of atheists because God says that they don't exist. I have a disbelief in atheists. So I'm an a-atheist. Now, um, you have the burden. And what I've heard, uh, well, 
when I've said that to people, I say, now prove that you're an atheist, and there's all sorts of um, answers that, that people have given. What kind of answers have you received? Well, the, the most common one that I think that you'll hear is this one. This is the one you always hear right off the bat. Well, uh, what are you talking about? That, that's, uh, that's stupid. Uh, there's obviously, there's atheists. Look at me, you're talking to one. I'm an atheist. It's just obvious. And so what your response to that is, you say, oh, okay, that, that worked for me. That was, that was a good proof. I accept that. Now I do believe in the existence of atheists. That was very good. So now do you want me to prove God's existence? And they're going to say, well, yeah, go ahead. And you're going to say, well, it's just obvious. God exists. I mean, everywhere you look, there's evidence of his existence. What, what are you, you're blind? You can't see it. And they're going to say, that, that's not a proof for God's existence. Uh, and you're going to say, well, I just learned that from you. I'm playing your game. That's what you wanted to play. The way you mm-hmm. proved your atheism was, well, what do you mean? It's just obvious. It's obvious atheists exist. Um, and so you, that's all that you did was say, well, it's just obvious God exists. And if he doesn't accept that proof from you, then you're not going to accept that proof from him. And you're back r- right back at square one. So the atheist now has to prove that uh, atheists exist. That's pretty clever. Uh, where did you get that at? Did you did you? Well, I've never heard that specifically, but basically you hear things like that. Uh, for example, when Gordon Stein um, told Greg Bonson in their debate, he said, "Well, nature just behaves in a law like way. That's just that's just the nature of matter. That's the way that it is." Bonson said, "Well, if that's just the, that, I mean, if that's the way it is, well, then here's my ex- uh, proof for God's existence. That's just the way that it is." So basically, anytime someone makes a claim like that, you're going to have to jump all over it. So Mike Butler uh, told uh, told me at some in some of the classes I was taking at um, Bonson Theological Seminary, uh, when someone comes up to you and says, "Well, it's just obvious. Such and such is obvious. Such and such is that that's simple." What you need to do is not just let that slide. You can say, "Well, if it's so obvious, then tell me about it." So what they're just basically saying is, "Well, it's just obvious atheists exist," and you're just going to use that proof for God's existence. And if they um, they don't like the proof, then you're not going to let them use that proof, and then you're going to ask them to show what's so obvious. Another thing that they try to do then is they say, well, why don't you take my testimony? For example, on xchristian.net, this is one of the arguments that uh, a man by the name of James uh, or J. Lazarus used. Uh, he's a guy from Strong Christian. He's written some things on the Internet. About Does he claim his- to be formally a Christian? I don't believe so. Okay. He was, I think, called on that website. And he has written some articles on presuppositionalism. And one of his arguments was, well, why don't you take the say-so of all these people? I mean, they're saying they're an atheist. You've got 50 people here telling you they're an atheist. You don't know them. more. I mean, you just met them on xchristian.net. And they've been living with themselves their whole life. You know, they know themselves better than you, so why don't you take their word for it? Mm-hmm. And basically, the response to that is, well... Again, your worldview determines these sorts of things. So, from within my worldview, the reason I don't take their word for it is, one, let God be true, though all men are liars, according to Paul in Romans 3. So, God told me, the one who knows everything, the one who made the, the so-called atheist, the one who knows them better than they know themselves, has told me that they are self-deluded fools who hate Jesus and hate knowledge and follow, follow a knowledge falsely so-called. So, if someone like that existed, a self-deluded fool who hated knowledge, why would you take his say-so for it, and not the say-so of the one who knows everything? All right. Let's go to our phones. We have Dustin calling from uh, High Point, North Carolina. Dustin, welcome to The Narrow Mind. Hey, Pastor Gene. How are you doing? Good, good. Good to, good to hear your voice again. I can barely hear you guys. Okay. We'll try to uh, get that fixed. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, Dustin, you still there with us? Yes. Okay. That's much better. All right. What's on your mind tonight? I just wanted to call in and um, bug a bunch of pastors tonight. (laughs) Well, there's not a bunch here, so. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Actually, uh, Paul is not a pastor. He's uh, he might be a pastor in training. We're not sure yet. Yeah. I thought you were. I thought you were pastor in the church, Paul. No, I'm not. I I attend a church. Okay. Well, that's good. Good to yes. know you do that. Yes. <laughs> I'm the fellow that sent you the uh, emails regarding graphics and abortion. Oh, um, Pastor, uh, yeah, Pastor, Pastor Seeger. Seeger. Yes, Pastor Seeger. Okay. Yes. But I How are you doing? That. Doing great. I just uh, I saw you guys were on and um, just checking out the show and I just praise God that we've got some men out here who are trying to stand up and show these atheists what they really are. 
I praise God for that because they need to be told that, um, and you guys are doing it. I, I wanted to um, ask you, Paul, a question. I know that in one of the forums on UnchainRadio.com, you made mention that that you you made a really good statement. I'd like you to elaborate on a little bit. That you believe that taking an evidentialist approach, or even a, I guess we could consider the classical approach that as well, to be sinful. It's a sinful approach, um, basically because I guess. I guess where you would be coming from is essentially it's calling God a liar. Um, in um, Romans chapter one verse eighteen, because um, the evidentialists such as Geisler and some of these other guys, even though they wouldn't deny the role of the Holy Spirit, they would say you know that the Holy Spirit um, is there. But you know if we got this evidence here, it's just going to kind of help out a little bit. And there's no question God uses means to accomplish his ends. Any good Calvinist believes God can use just about anything. Well, God can use pretty much anything to bring about his will. Mm-hmm. But um, you'd made that statement, and I guess I'm trying to understand what you exactly mean by you believe that it's sinful for people to use kind of the, the approach that Mr. Gastrich had used. Okay. To try to discuss some of this. Well, basically, uh, a qualification would be called for I don't. First off, let me say I don't believe that my evidentialist brothers are consciously going out and saying let's let's do this sin. Right. So I don't think that it's a conscious thing that they're sitting there and saying, well, I know this is wrong and I'm going to uh, do this sin anyways. But things can still be wrong if you violate God's law, if you violate um, His character. You you still can be sinning even if you don't know about it, and that's what, what the uh, sense that I'm calling it sinful in. Right. And so a few examples would be. Basically, when the evidentialist, and we could cite numerous examples if you read their literature, oh, yeah. um, it, when they say that God needs to be um, proven, like he's, for, for example, in Jesus Under Fire, uh, yep. I believe William Lane Craig writes, well, uh, it's, it's, we need to follow the rules of evidence like you would in a court. Right. in a courtroom to show that God exists. Well, what that's doing is it's, it's saying that God is the defendant. He's sitting in the defendant's chair, and he somehow needs to show, man, uh, prove his own innocence. He needs to show men, give them examples and evidence that he does exist. Well, yeah. Put man, God in the dock. Right, work. as C.S. Lewis said, correct. Yeah. And what, um, what the problem is, is man is in the dock. Man is in the judgment seat. Right. Um, man is, needs, is, the, need, is the one who needs to prove his innocence before a holy God. Um, and God has furnished man so much evidence and made his existence so plain to them that they are without an excuse for denying him. So it's not like, well, I, I see you atheist. You have some good reasons uh, to not believe that God exists. But here, let me give you some reasons to think that God probably does exist. Yeah. Because you've just reduced God to then a probability, yeah. and if if that's what you've done, well then, even if it's a 99.9% probability chance that God exists, well then, guess what? There's one, there's a 0.1% chance that God doesn't exist, and that's where the atheist is going to run to. And from his point of view, that 1% looks like a 99% from his side, and we have the 1%. Mm-hmm. And furthermore, if he has no excuse, then he can go to God, you know, hypothetically speaking, on the last day and say, well, you know, God, I had this excuse. Your existence was only probable. It wasn't for sure. So there was 1% excuse that I had. And so that's one example that I, that I call, um, those are some examples of why the evidentialist method is sinful. Furthermore, I think some of the arguments are fallacious. Uh, and I think that it's wrong to argue fallaciously. Right. Um, it'd be uh, uh, committing fallacies are, are, are sinful as well. They're in, uh, akin to lying in a sense. Yeah. Well, you know, if if I understand you correctly, Paul, it sounds to me like uh, going back to this courtroom analogy. You, you know, we had a high profile. We've still got. Well, it's over now. But there's a ho- high profile uh, case that's been on the news. Uh, he was actually convicted. I'm talking of Scott Peterson. Right. What's interesting about that case is that Scott Peterson's parents believe that he's innocent because he said he was innocent. Uh, Lacey Peterson's parents believe he's guilty, not because of what he said, but because of the evidence that's been presented. Now, here's the thing. Uh, They're looking at the same evidence, but because of their presuppositions, in other words, because of a parent's love for a son, and their unwillingness to even imagine that their son could have done something like this, because they love him so much, obviously, uh, the, the burden of proof is much higher for them, because 
they don't want to believe that their son is guilty. They can't. And so, yeah, they can't believe. Right. So, with all the evidence that was given, now some would argue that it's circumstantial evidence, none, none the fact, uh, nonetheless, I mean, come on, if you follow that case, you'll see all the circumstantial evidence together lumps up to one big, fat, guilty uh you know, guilty position on the part of Scott Peterson. And that's why the jury condemned him. But our presuppositions, what we come into the courtroom with, is going to affect the way that we interpret the evidence that's put before us. And what we're saying is that the unbeliever lives, according to the scripture, he's blind, he's deaf, he's spiritually dead, he's dumb, he's lame, he's a fool, he, he needs to be born again. He's not even spiritually alive. How is he going to be able to properly interpret spiritual truth, which can only be spiritually discerned? And the answer is, he can't. But nonetheless, we do give evidences uh, to the unbeliever, but we must realize that at the end of the day, it's the Word and the Spirit that's going to change his heart. Yeah. It's, it's the Gospel, the good news, combined with the, the operation of the Spirit that changes a man's heart and brings him over from condemnation to to freedom and from unbelief to belief. And so, in our apologetic, the one who gets the glory is God because we know ultimately that we're just watering and planting and He's the one that's giving the increase. Uh, so, we got another call, Dustin. I want to go ahead and um, say goodbye to you. I, I, I thank you for calling up once again. Amen. And uh, look, always look forward to Good talking to you, you, Dustin. You guys keep it up. God bless. All right. Thank we'll you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we're going to go to Craig Souter calling from Orlando, Florida. Craig, welcome to The Narrow Mind. How you doing, Gene and Paul? I'm doing great. great. How you doing? Doing good. I uh, just wanted to give you all a call and tell you I appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, uh, Paul, it's good to hear you on the show tonight, and I appreciate uh, uh, all the help that you've given me. Uh, Paul and I are uh, pretty good friends. That we, uh, we met in another message board uh, on the Internet. We keep in contact quite a bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I someone that... Uh, his name was Dustin. He asked the question, and uh, I, I missed part of it. Uh, he asked the question, uh, Paul, about something that you had said in, uh, in uh, one of the message boards about uh, other apologetic methods being sinful. And uh, I just wanted to kind of comment on that because uh, I had John Frame uh, for uh, Systematic Theology at RTS uh, mm -hmm. not too long ago, and he said, uh, you know, that, that, that really, you, you know, like for example, Thomas Aquinas, uh, someone like that, who uh, was uh, one of the great stalwarts of classical apologetics, uh, really, you, you know, his, his apologetic in principle uh, might uh, kind of put God in the dock, uh, as you as you would say. Uh, but really, uh, Aquinas himself, uh, you, you know, he held Christian presuppositions, and so really, uh, in his thinking, you know, he still, as a Christian, as someone uh, who uh, who knows the Lord. Uh, he did have God, uh, you know, uh, first in his, he did presuppose God in his thinking. It's like Greg Bonson said uh, in uh, one of his lectures, uh, when you look at the evidence uh, of the resurrection and uh, things like that, and, and, you know, as someone from an evidentialist perspective, you know, the reason the, the, the evidence of the resurrection uh, that someone like Gary Habermas might set forth uh, the reason it makes sense is because, well, you know, as Christians, we have the right presuppositions. Right. And uh, that's why it makes sense to us. And uh, that's why, you know, St. Thomas was uh, convinced by his uh, his five ways, uh, his five proofs. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, would, would you agree with me then that uh, really, uh, like, like classical apologetics and evidentialists, uh, they're sinful uh, maybe in principle, uh, but uh, you might be able to make a difference uh you know, as far as the actual person, uh, th their actual presuppositions, it's kind of an inconsistency, maybe in a way. Uh, well, would you agree with that assessment at all? Yes, and what I told um, Pastor Dustin was that I'm, I'm not saying that they're out being outwardly, consciously sinful. Um, what I'm saying is that it's it's they're, they they might very well not be aware of what they're doing, but what they're doing, the method that they have. Um, is sinful. So, there, for example, I could be doing something that I'm not aware of that still is a sin. It's violating God's law. And for, for right now, I'm not aware of it until God chooses to show me that I'm doing that or um, I, I read his word and, and, and say, oh, I've been doing this thing. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I hadn't previously thought that, that what I was doing was wrong. So I'm not saying that they're being sinful outwardly uh, and consciously. Uh, but furthermore, to more specifically address your point, 
uh, it's kind of funny how, I mean, most event, uh, evidentialists and classicists and um, t- Thomists and whatnot, they, they do say, well, I'm a Christian, I do presuppose God exists, I know that he exists, and, and so forth. But then when they get into the apologetic arena, then all of a sudden that, that goes out the window. So they, they presuppose that God exists on Sunday morning from their pulpits, uh, and, and say, well, Jesus said this, um, ladies and gentlemen, you need to do it, you need to believe it. But when they get into the apologetics arena, they put that aside. Right. And right. If, they're, if they're truly, um, now they're either doing what, here's another thing where, where you can, depending on the presupposition or the uh, evidential literature that we could use to support this, there's you know so much out there, but you would have some evidentialists who would say, um, you could show that what they're doing is basically saying, I'm... Um, uh, I, I'm telling the unbeliever that I'm being neutral and I'm not presupposing right. God, but I really am presupposing God. So, so when we argue with them, they say, "No, no, I, I am presupposing God." And we'll say, "Well, look at your what you've written in your book. You've said I'm going to be neutral here. I'm going to make no presupposition. So what you've done there is to is to lie. You're right. telling the unbeliever you're being neutral when you're not." Hmm. You know what? I want to I want to ask you a question, uh, Paul, that just came up in the uh, in the chat text. And for those of you that might be interested, we also have a chat text room open at Paltech, Paltech, paltalk.com uh, under the Christianity section. Um, one of the men says, or I'm assuming it's a man, uh, Lamech451 is his screen name. He, he typed in that wait, uh, uh, debating atheist or arguing with atheist is a waste of time. You should just preach the gospel to them and walk away. And uh, I type back to him that, are you saying that Paul wasted his time or Peter wasted his time? And he says, no, um, they weren't, they weren't, uh, Mars Hill wasn't about um, atheists because they were theists. So how would you respond to, to that type of a comment? Well, again, earlier I made the distinction that uh, the, the theist, whatever that is, um, the, the so-called uh, polytheists that they were, um, are just brothers under the skin with an atheist. They're in, they hold the same worldview, which is there's only two worldviews: one worldview for Christ and one worldview against Him. Uh, so the, they, the atheist holds the worldview against Him, and the so-called uh, theists, this, the people that Mar, uh, Paul debated on Mars Hill, they also hold the same worldview that the atheist holds. So what you're really saying is. Um, well, you shouldn't debate atheists because, uh, but you should debate these other people, even though they both hold the same worldview. So I think that's really um, an inconsistency. Yeah, there yeah. like, like if, if, if theism is, a, is a, some type of valid position. And by the way, um, Peter's the one that tells us, be ready to give an answer to every man who asks. Yeah. He doesn't just say to the, to the atheists, or I, I'm not to the atheists, just to the theists, uh, we are to be prepared to engage Every man, whether he claims to be a theist or he's an atheist, if he's not in Christ, um, the bottom line is he's going to hell because he's under God's well, judgment. What you really, I think, what's re- also going on here is you have some sort of a uh, prejudicial uh, stance going right. on here. You're saying, well, these people I'll talk to, even though they hold an anti-Christian worldview and they hate God yeah. just as much as the atheists. And you say, well, I'll talk to them, I'll debate them, but these atheists, you're just a waste of time. Yeah. Now they 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 can be talked to just like just like everyone else can. Yeah, Craig. Thanks for the call. We're running out of time. Oh, no problem. Thank All you, right. guys. See you, Craig. Okay. Uh, yeah. The 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 thing that this this person is is failing to realize, this person that's in the text chat, is that all men know God. The Bible already tells us that all men know God. So to say that he's a theist but he's not a Christian, we already we already established that. Okay. So somebody's not listening carefully. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you for coming on the program again. Thanks, Jim. I always look forward to talking to you, and Likewise. thank you for listening. If you're listening to this program, once again, our uh, broadcast originates from the unchainedradio.com website. Please pay us a visit. Send us an email. We'll talk to you next week. God bless you.